85% of our healthcare costs in the United States are from diet-related chronic diseases. I learned about the suffering of dairy cows, and as an economist, I thought, there's no way in hell I would treat that cow any good if I'm a profit-maximizing firm. I was suing CAFOs for water pollution and realized at a certain point I didn't want any part of that. First of all, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Cameron, uh, and myself, along with Leo up here in the front, uh, we run Columbia ASAP, Allied Scholars for Animal Protection. We're a club on campus, not officially recognized yet, but soon. Um, and we're part of the larger nonprofit by the same name, ASAP. Uh, we focus on, as the name implies, uh, issues of animal rights. Okay. On campus, we do outreach, we do educational events like this, uh, we encourage students to take action against animal exploitation by going vegan and considering career paths that will help animals. I'll talk more about this at the end of the event. We humans violate and exploit other animals in many different ways on a literally incomprehensible scale. We eat their flesh and secretions, we wear their skin, wool, fur, and down. We torture them in chemical experiments. We force them to do our labor. We use them as entertainment. We buy them when we feel lonely and want a companion, and we send them back when the pandemic is over. But the industries that exploit animals, the largest of which is animal agriculture, they don't just hurt animals. They also hurt humans in numbers that are, once again, incomprehensible and bound to increase over the next few years. Animal agriculture, which necessarily includes the crops uh, grown to feed animals, is a primary emitter of greenhouse gases. It is one of, if not the leading cause of myriad environmental catastrophes like deforestation, land use, fresh water use, and more. Um, by way of our diets, it is a major contributor to some of the biggest killers in the developed world, developed world such as heart disease and cancer. It presents a terrifyingly high risk of zoonotic viruses, viruses that could make COVID look like a joke. This is all to say that beyond the injustice to animals, the animal agriculture and related industries are tied up in some of the largest and most urgent global problems that we must face. This is the motivation for our event tonight, the urgent problems that in some way, shape, or form can be connected to the industries in which sentient animals are the commodity. Tonight, you're gonna to hear from three Columbia professors who I'll introduce in a minute. Each of them works in a different field and will bring a different perspective. I reached out to them a few weeks ago asking if they would prepare a short presentation with a very general prompt. I asked them to speak about any of the issues surrounding animal use, drawing on past work or experience in their field. So this could be taken in a number of directions, um, and that was intentional. For example, related sub-questions might be, what are the implications for our consumption, consumption choices? Uh, what are interventions uh, at local, regional, national, international scales? Uh, how can or how should we understand these problems on a conceptual level? My goal for this event, or our, our goal for this event, um, is that by asking these questions and confronting these topics, students will, one, get a chance to see the breadth of backgrounds, skill sets, and approaches needed to address the global challenges mentioned previously. And two, consider the impact of their choices, be it consumption or career related, on the planet, humans, and other animals. I'm very, very happy uh, that tonight we're gonna hear about a wide range of these topics, from local research, things that are going on here in New York City, to global industry scale. So after the talks, we're gonna have some time for Q&A. And if there is still time left after that, uh, I just wanna open it up for people to meet other people here. Uh, if you wanna to speak to one of the professors one-on-one, -on -one, uh, that's an option. Uh, basically, some time for casual discussion. Uh, I just wanna note that the third speaker who's on the flyer can't be here in person due to kind of a unforeseen circumstance, but we are gonna have him present on uh, basically remotely. So please bear with us as we uh, kind of transition into that for the last speaker. Okay, I'm gonna introduce the first speaker. Professor Isaac Bjorki is a lecturer in economics at Columbia. Prior to joining uh, Columbia, Isaac completed his PhD in economic theory at NYU in 2022. 
Playing with the philosophical tenets of eating animals as a young adult, through veganism, Isaac found tremendous profundity in rejecting fundamental social norms and defaults. He was surprised to repeatedly hear incoherent arguments in favor of eating animals from brilliant colleagues whom he believed to be some of the world's greatest intellects. These types of challenges drew Isaac to a career in teaching rather than academic publication, not only as a pleasurable source of income, but also as a more efficient means to intellectual discourse in the face of a disappointing research culture. For the past few years, Isaac has drifted from mathematical modeling to the qualitative comparison of social theory more broadly, with a particular focus on the sociology of science, economics, and the forces of neoliberal ideology. I hope you guys are looking forward to this talk. I definitely am, so please welcome Professor Isaac Burton. slides or a prep talk because I think the talk that I really want to prepare is kind of conditional on a question that I don't know the answer to, which is about all of you. Um, so I guess I have a question, and maybe not my first question today, and I'll need serious honesty or else my talk's going to turn to gibberish, so you got to be honest. Um, so who here is and feels they are a vegan? Okay, so some. Uh, how about who here is a vegetarian or is trying to be vegetarian or leans towards vegetarianism because it seems attractive in some way? Okay, and then how many of you are just here because it seems cool? I don't know your friends are here. Okay, so you see we're at uh, very, very different places. Um, now, since there are some vegans in the room and some vegetarians and very few of the normies here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and talk crazy. I'm going to explain to you all my experience with being a heretic. Um, and of course, I don't mean my experience becoming senile or seeing delusional, I don't know, um, psychedelic experiences on a day to day basis or something. No, I'm, I'm alert. I teach mathematics and I'm hopefully decently articulate. Um, but what I mean is that being vegan is hard. Um, and it's tough to say because actually what I want to tell the whole world is that it's the easiest thing ever. Uh, I spend less money on my food. I am just healthy by default. Um, this might be uncomfortable for some of you, but I never knew I was lactose intolerant until suddenly, 10 years in, I just live a diarrhea-free life. That's kind of convenient. Um, so veganism's easy, except it's hard. And it's hard because Every conversation you will ever have as a vegan is hard. And it's not because of the difficulty of explaining the concepts of why someone would want to be vegan. It's difficult, the types of responses you'll hear in response. Um, and so, as mentioned in my introduction, I started a PhD, I found veganism. I never went vegan, I never decided to turn on a switch. Um, I learned about the suffering of dairy cows, and as an economist, I thought, huh, if I'm a farmer, there's no way in hell I would treat that cow any good if I'm a profit-maximizing firm. And as you should all know, today we live in the world of capos and factory farms. These are profit-maximizing firms, and indeed they have no interest in treating the cows well at all. And so I saw that, and I thought, oh, so vegans aren't people who just like the, the feeling of being vegan. They actually have a pragmatic reason for being vegan. There's reasons to not drink milk. Um, and just to clarify, for anyone who's not a vegan or not a vegetarian or has never kind of approached this discourse, there's usually the big three reasons for approaching this type of lifestyle. One, of course, is the protection of animals. So for me, learning that dairy cows are treated just as poorly as a beef cow, this was quite upsetting. Then there's also the other two issues of, one I guess you could call ecology or our environmental health of our planet. And as you know, cows fart. Cows also like to eat. Uh, they eat a lot. And in fact, in order for us to get beef, they, 
food at Thunk have to eat more calories for us to get calories back. And then lastly, there's this issue of health, and as it turns out, Barry doesn't really have very strong legs to stand on. Um, just before turning vegan, I tore my ACL, and without thinking twice, you know, I'm the kid drinking a glass of milk thinking that the calcium is going to heal my ligaments. Uh, I assure you, to this day, I've never seen such research. So when I found out that, you know, even something like dairy, which isn't the, the carcass of the animal, still is quite a big problem in all three of these areas, I thought, well then maybe I don't really have a reason to drink this stuff. Maybe when I go to the grocery store, I, I'll wait till I buy milk again, I'll wait till I buy cream cheese again, until I can actually justify it to myself. And I did, and with a degree in statistics, I said I can read any scientific literature, and I'll, surely I'll eventually find the literature that tells me some amount of dairy is good for you. Um, here we are, I'm still searching. So if someone has that, uh, make it public. Uh, it won't last very long, probably. So, I became vegan, not really because I flipped the switch, but after a few months I realized, oh, this is who I am. I've been doing this for a few months, diarrhea free, and I haven't found a good reason to change yet. And as mentioned, I have yet to have great conversations with other economists about this stuff. There are plenty of other economists who do feel quite strongly that they want to contribute to these big three issues. There are health economists. There are this many economists who like animals. Um, and then there's plenty of environmental economists. And so of course I looked in those directions. And that wasn't enough. I, I'm trying to be vegan. I'm trying to say I don't accept this at all. If you're familiar, or if you go ahead and look at what a lot of environmental economic literature looks like, it's about cap and trade and quotas. It's saying we should fish just this much. We should farm dairy just this much. We should monocrop just this much. We should pay the Amazon just this much. Um, for me, for all of those cases, the this much that's acceptable is zero. Um, so these weren't very fruitful discourses that I had, not to mention lots of funny things that you hear, um, such as people starting to say, you know, I can't care about all the animals in the world. I don't even care about humans halfway across the world, which I would not encourage any of you to start to say. So what you encounter is uh, what people in lots of disciplines come to call mental gymnastics. Uh, these are good times to be aware of some mental gymnastics. Um, but when you talk to non-vegans or the lay person about eating animals, man, what a good anthropological study of mental gymnastics. You will see some crazy things. And so if I could say anything to all of you, vegan or not, um, this is a lifestyle that's worth pursuing. I have approached this from a completely positivist scientific perspective. I've been waiting for someone to give me a compelling reason to eat some animal product, and I have been waiting 10 years and I haven't found it yet. Um, so in that time, I like to teach, I've avoided research publication a bit because this environmental economic stuff wasn't for me. Um, and in doing so, what I've kind of come to the conclusion is that veganism is a part of what I would generally call Western ideology. Um, and many other people would maybe refer to this as a dominance ideology. And this is very over overgeneralizing the differences of what is West and what is East. But certainly we can say that Western culture has kind of had this tradition of feeling like we need to control nature. Um, and we see this in lots and lots of different places. And a lot of what we call progressive culture, I would gladly call undoing Western culture. Okay, Undoing things like racism, things like sexism, and indeed things like animal dominion. Um, you'll see this in, in agriculture, whether or not you're talking about growing soybeans or corn to feed animals or not, the aspect of monoculture as a dominance over soil is growing as it's, it's proving to be a major, major problem in lots of disciplines. So veganism touches on this, and it touches on this in a way that it hits your heartstrings because most vegans do end up watching what the process of animal slaughter is like, but it opens your mind. It opens up your critical faculties. It makes you comfortable with being a spooky heretic who can talk about diarrhea sometimes. And I would encourage you all to think that maybe that's not so hard. 
So that's all I got for now. Next speaker is Professor Pam Cook. Dr. Cook is the Mary Schwartz Rose Associate Professor of Nutrition and Education Health Studies in Applied Educational Psychology and Applied Educational Psychology. Uh, she is the faculty director of the Lori M. Fish Center for Food, Education, and Policy, uh, and the co-director of the Center for Sustainable Futures. Pam conducts research with schools and communities to give people power to demand healthy, just, sustainable food. She translates her research into curricula for school teachers, recommendations for policymakers, and resources for advocates. Her work contributes to increased access to nutritious, delicious, equitable, and sustainable food for all. Thank you so much for having me. And what I love about this is that the prompt was so incredibly general that I think all three of us are going to take a really, really different approach to how we are talking. And I think that that will make this such a, a great and dynamic conversation. And one of the things that I thought a lot about when thinking about um, what to say here was that it said, forget, that I forgot what the flyer said, but it was like, forget your career, think about your passion. And what I feel so incredibly fortunate, and I would guess I am the oldest person physically in this room right now, I think, um, is that I have been able to follow my passion with my career, and that has been such a blessing. And so I hope that all of you can do that as well. And so what I wanna do is just show you a little bit about my journey. Um, I first came to Teachers College to visit, which is where I am now at Columbia, in 1987, way, way, way before probably many of you were born. I was a junior in college. I was first generation to go to college in my family and did not think I was ever going to go to graduate school, but was coming with some friends who were looking at the program in nutrition where I, I now teach, I'm a professor, um, and was like, if I ever got to go to graduate school, that's where I would go because I want to learn how to help people figure out how to change how they eat. And I ended up doing, going in a very different direction. I actually did my undergraduate at Rutgers, stayed at Rutgers to do my master's right away because I got very lucky and got offered a full scholarship. So then several years later, 1992, five years later, I applied for the doctorate in education program at Teachers College and was accepted. So it was kind of like a dream, right? That I got to actually go where I had said this would be the place for me. In 1997, uh, again, five years later, we wrote a grant, and I say we because it was with my doctoral advisor, Dr. Isabel Contento, to the National Institutes of Health to create something called the Linking Food and the Environment Curriculum. So it was actually combining thinking about our environment as well as thinking about health and teaching that to school children so that they could make choices that would be healthy. We just kept getting grants, kept getting grants, which was really, really amazing. And then we're really fortunate that Lori Tisch um, ended up saying she wanted to give some money to start a center. So that's when we launched the Lori M. Tisch Center for Food, Education, and Policy, for short, the Tisch Food Center, TFC, and I was the founding executive director. And then I became research faculty, and then, whoops, um, then I became full faculty, I guess, I, I, somehow the circle got cut off, in 2021. So it truly was a dream come true from saying this is the place where I wanted to be to ending up being on the faculty and wanting to go to teacher's college because I wanted to work with school children to have them be able to eat in ways that would care for themselves, care for the planet. Um, and so. We do food and nutrition education in schools, so it's hands-on engaging activities focused on specific behaviors, so like eating more fruits and vegetables, not eating dairy, whatever it is, like the specific behaviors that you're doing to provide students with motivation, skills, knowledge, and confidence, as well as to provide a supportive environment, because if we look across New York City and you go into different neighborhoods, being able to get food that nourishes us is really different in different neighborhoods. So students can want to um, and, and can make choices that are healthy for themselves, their communities, and the planet. 
And this is where it gives them power to actually try to change the system. All of us, whether you are eat, eat animals and plants, are vegetarian or vegan, if we want to eat to nourish our bodies, we are navigating through a challenging food supply. Our current food supply is really challenging and we all need to be advocating for bettering the food supply as well. So I often like to talk, when I talk to kids, I talk about how we have to navigate and advocate for, to make um, the food supply better for all of us. So why do we do this in schools? Education is primary prevention. Actually, 85% of our healthcare costs in the United States are from diet-related chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes, some forms of, of cancer, cardiovascular disease. And if we can have children eating for their health and for the environment, that's primary prevention. The current food environment is challenging, as I just talked about. And today's children are tomorrow's adults that are going to be facing the crisis to both healthcare as well as to our ecosystem. And as Cameron said in the introduction and Isaac said, a lot of that is from how we are producing our food, particularly how we are producing animals that humans are eating. Um, we also want children to eat well. This is just to show you national data on how people are eating. This is on a 100 point scale. And this is how different age groups are doing. So little children usually tend to eat pretty well. Older adults are eating, well, that's not even well. It's an actually a D, right? Out of, if, if you think of it on like a grading scale. But look at children, school age children are the lowest scored. I want to say that, um, and as probably the oldest, one of the oldest people in the room, is that the food supply has changed dramatically for the worse in the last many decades. And some people say like, well, they'll just start eating better as they get older. See how people do that? We don't know that because the people that are on the end there had a very different food supply. So are they just continuing the habits that they had their whole lives? Or do people eat better as they get older? Now, a lot of people as they get older start to have health issues and get concerned and so may improve their diets because of that, but we don't know that it's going to pick up. That is why I believe we have to be sharing with our school children how we can eat well. We also want to promote food justice because our youth are experiencing food injustices every day by the inequities in food available in our neighborhoods. Food justice addresses inequities and youth can make positive changes. When youth are going to government officials, to other people and saying, we want to change how we eat, um, we want to change what's available, that can make a huge difference. So I just want to talk a little bit about our research. We really were curious about how much schools were getting food and nutrition education programs. And this was a long time ago in 2011 and 12. And what we found is that 39% of the, and this was with elementary schools in three boroughs, were getting some of these food and nutrition education programs, but a lot more. We were then able to repeat this five years later in 2016 to 17, um, and this time it was K to 12 in all the boroughs, and good news is, it was actually much higher. 55, almost 56% of the schools were getting these programs um, and fewer weren't. And then when we compare just what was actually um, done in the first one, which was elementary schools in three boroughs, we actually found that there was a huge increase. So in those five years, many, many more children were getting things like gardening and cooking and all these experiences in schools, which were great. Um, we, we have the data, which isn't quite public yet, for last school year. We ended up taking a little bit more than five years to do it again because of the pandemic. We were really worried because a lot of this programming had to get cut because of all the changes that happened, but it looks like it's going to be about equal. Um, and then we decided to go from our research to try to take action, practice, and advocacy. So as probably all of you can recognize, the person standing there is Mayor Eric Adams. This was actually when he was Brooklyn Borough President. This was in 2018. And he said, I want school children to be able to learn to eat well 
As probably most of you know, he eats a whole food plant-based diet and has been able to reverse his diabetes, which means he's controlling type 2 diabetes by not taking any medication by his diet and lifestyle, which is fabulous. And he said, I want the children of today to not have to have that and have a better experience. So we had a large group of people at Brooklyn Borough Hall to push for how do we get this into more schools? And like I said, this was in the fall of 2018. We were then really lucky in um, 2019 to get funding from New York City Council to start what's called the Food Ed Hub that ends up um, supporting all of this work in schools so that we can advance this and get all children having these kinds of experiences. So this is just a little bit about what's on the Food Ed Hub website. This is us advocating for food education on the steps of City Hall. Um, actually, at this point in time, we were trying to push for a bill that would have schools report how children are learning about food in schools, what kind of programs that they have. And then in June of 2023, so um, just over six months ago, Mayor Adams unveiled an educational roadmap to pr uh, promote healthier school communities across New York City. And that at that time was a launching um, of this, this, um, this roadmap prioritizing food education in New York City public schools. Um, and so what this has done is there has been a very, very big push to make the menus in schools more plant-based. There's still a long way to go for them to be plant-based. Um, and truthfully, on the days when there's not meat, there's still a lot of cheese. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons from where food comes, you know, from how school meals policy works. We can push to have that be changed. Um, and to also have children have these great food education experiences. So actually this year through funding from the city, 60 schools are getting to increase that programming that is going on in schools to get more of it. Now, there's 1,800 schools in New York City. So if you quickly do the math, we have a long way to go, but that's not the only programming that's going on. It's just 60 schools that are getting to increase that programming. So. I believe that when we have school children get great experiences growing food in school gardens, they are then learning how food production works. They can then like be those critical citizens that are saying, what kind of farms do we want in the future? How do we want farms to be treated? Anyone that learns about confined animal feeding operations, CAFOs, would not want to eat the meat that comes from there, even if they eat meat, if they really understood that. And so by having them have experiences with gardening, with cooking, with trying foods, particularly children that are coming from communities where really getting fresh, whole, plant-based foods can be challenging, when they get those experiences, it makes them into the advocates that are going to be pushing for a better food future for all of us. So I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Professor Lehner, can you hear and see clearly? I can hear and I can see. Okay, perfect. Let me just find more questions. Okay. Professor Lehner directs Earth Justice's Sustainable Food and Farming Program. Peter is one of the leading experts on the impact of agriculture on climate change and is the author of the book Farming for Our Future, the Science, Law, and Policy of Climate Neutral Agriculture. Do not read it. Go by the book. Peter has served in many roles, including as a clerk for Chief Judge James Browning of the Ninth Circuit, as the Chief uh, of the Environmental Protection Bureau of uh, the New York State Attorney General's Office, and as the executive director of the Natural Resources Defense Council. 
Uh, Peter is a Columbia Law grad, and he serves on the board of the Rainforest Alliance and the Environmental Advocates of New York. He helps manage two mid-sized farms and teaches a course on agriculture and environmental law at Columbia and the other law schools. Um, if you'd like to share your screen and start your presentation, that would be great. Okay. Is that working? Can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah, we can. Okay. Great. Uh, well, first, uh, I will say that it was uh, wonderful to <coughs> hear uh, Pam's talk, and uh, I fit her example, which is that uh, long ago I was suing CAFOs for water pollution and realized at a certain point I didn't want any part of that. So about 30 years ago, my family uh, and we all became vegetarians because, uh, because really of what I had seen of how meat is produced in this country. So I'm coming at this from, my journey was a little bit different. I've always been an environmental advocate. I got into environmental work from really like many others being out uh, in the outdoors uh, and uh, went to uh, law school in order to environmental protection, which for the most part is uh, going after pollution, uh, industrial pollution, power plant pollution, uh, cleaner vehicles, you name it. And what I discovered over the years of working is that agriculture is an enormous source of pollution. Uh, right now it is one of the, it's really the largest source of water pollution, one of the largest sources of air pollution, drives biodiversity loss, climate change. Uh, and yet our environmental laws uh, don't uh, treat it very well. Uh, we can't use the same laws that we use to address industrial pollution to address uh, agricultural pollution, and, which I'll explain more in, in a little bit. So over the time, I've ended up realizing that's the big challenge, and so I'm now focusing on, on that. Uh, for example, when I worked with the New York City Water Supply, I knew that I we were, as, as all of you drink New York City water, and I hope you appreciate it, uh, it's really one of the marvels of human engineering that all this clean water comes to the city almost without uh, treatment. Uh, and now some about 10% of it is treated, but most of the rest of it is not. And that's because it's kept clean. And part of the way it's kept clean is a whole program to make sure that sewage treatment plants and septic systems and other things don't pollute the water in upstate New York. But what we discovered is that the law gives us a lot of tools to address pollution from many sources, but really not from agriculture. Uh, so that's why we have to work on that prior specifically. And when I talk about climate change in agriculture, uh, I subtitle the talk cows, corn, and crap, uh, because that's really all you need to know. If that's your one takeaway from my talk, that's it, because that's the, what causes agriculture's contribution to climate change. The cows and their belching and their manure uh, and the corn that they eat. So uh, let me give a quick overview of the ag system uh, from an environmental perspective. Um, first of all, it just has to understand how big it is and how much it is producing and also that it is meant to produce a, a tremendous amount of food. It's shaped profoundly by policy. It is not shaped by sort of indiv invisible market forces. For over 100 years, federal and state policies have very much focused, uh, shaped what we grow, where we grow, how we grow it. And as a result, it does exactly what it's intended to do, which is produce a tremendous amount of cheap food. Uh, much of that is not particularly nutritious food, as you just heard, uh, but it wasn't intended to produce nutritious food. It wasn't really intended to be good for the environment. It wasn't particularly intended to be good for the farmers. It was intended to be good for the food processors, and that's what it is. Uh, so it's also become, over time, a highly concentrated uh, business. In our history, we think of the small farms, the sort of, ag uh, sort of agricultural past. At one point, up to 50% of the, of the labor force was working on farms. All around the country, you'll see small farms, or you'll think about small farms, and that's still the image. But that is basically irrelevant today. Uh, and just last week, the most recent census of agriculture comes out. It's done every about five years. And that shows that yet again, we've lost hundreds of thousands of farms. The average farm is getting, that, that, that remains, is getting even bigger. These numbers uh, actually 
predate uh, the, the most recent census of agriculture, but you can see it's immensely concentrated. Um, so the image of a small farm is, is it's nice, but, and, and if you can uh, get food from a small integrated farm, uh, that might uh, be a pleasant experience, but virtually none of the food that you will get in a supermarket comes from that. They come in, all, all the meat in particular, virtually all the meat, comes from animal factories where they house tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of animals uh, in uh, often barely able to move conditions. And industrial agriculture today also uh, uses most of our land. We don't realize that. We think of uh, we're sort of a modern country, but still today, most of the land use changes that have happened in the U.S. and around the world is a function of agriculture. And this map, which was uh, done by Bloomberg, take a look at that enormous block in the middle. That is cattle grazing, uh, and then a little bit of grazing for other animals. Because cattle are uh, are different. A pig can have a bunch of piglets uh, and they breed them to have more and more piglets. And chicken have eggs and can pop out a lot of eggs. Cows will only have one calf uh, a year or so and then they have to be sort of be with their mother for a while and then they have to eat grass for a while before their skeleton can get strong enough to get put into a feedlot where they can then fed a lot of grain and get fat, uh, get you know, get up to slaughter weight quickly. So cattle need a tremendous amount of grazing, 800 million acres of land for grazing, even though almost all of them end up in a feedlot. And that is a tremendous amount of grain, and for over 100 years, I mean a tremendous amount of land, almost 100 years, it's been known that most of that is overgrazed. It's ecologically uh, impoverished of what, of what it could be. And then about half of that cropland, you see almost 400 million acres of cropland, goes to animal feed. And, uh, for example, it takes 15 pounds of grain to get a pound of beef. It's incredibly inefficient. Uh, it's, it's like driving a car that gets two miles a gallon. So land use, and then therefore biodiversity impacts, etc., is largely driven by animal agriculture. Um, and uh, I can go into this in longer detail, but I'll just touch on it. But right now, agriculture is, as I mentioned earlier, one of the main drivers of water pollution. Uh, both surface water and subsurface water, from which a lot of Americans get drinking water. Uh, it's the main cause of biodiversity loss, whether it be uh, wolves and bears or lots of smaller critters. Uh, and that's because of habitat loss or pesticides. Uh, it's the main cause of, of pollution that's in all of us. Um, if uh, any one of your blood if was sample was taken, uh, there would be dozens of pesticides, probably, and even if you eat almost all organic, uh, you will have dozens of pesticides in you just because it's around everywhere. And, and then, as, was, as Pam talked about earlier, the public health impact. We basically eat food that is causing us more disease than smoking. Uh, so it's a, it's a tricky system. But what a lot of people don't know is that it also drives as much climate change as the transportation system. When you think of climate change, you think of power plants burning coal and releasing CO2, and that's climate change. But in fact, agriculture's contribution to climate change is very different. There is some burning of fossil fuels for all the tractors and ventilation fans at the animal factories, et cetera. But most of the agriculture's contribution to climate change come from methane, which is much more powerful of greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And that mostly comes from cattle belches and animal manure festering in these big lagoons. Uh, and the other part is nitrous oxide, which comes from over-fertilization on fields. That extra fertilization, extra nitrogen fertilizer, either runs off and causes water pollution or goes into the atmosphere and, and, and causes climate change. And then the last part way agriculture causes contributes to climate change is healthy soil has a tremendous amount of carbon in it. When you overgraze it, or you convert it to land to grow corn and soy in particular, uh, you lose all that carbon. And you lose the ability of that land to keep storing and sequestering and breathing in and out carbon. So you have lost, uh, so over time, that loss of carbon is it a tremendous driver of climate change. Uh, 
At the same time, agriculture is uniquely affected by climate change uh, for all the reasons you can imagine, floods and droughts and heat waves and wildfires and the struggles of workers working in those conditions. But you also have you know, diseases growing into other areas that hadn't been there before and many, many others. And this is costing us literally tens of billions of dollars every year. We have a very robust crop insurance system in this country. So often farmers actually don't mind it because they're so heavily insured uh, and the insurance is so heavily subsidized by you and me, by the American taxpayer. Uh, but nonetheless, it is very much changing the landscape for, for agriculture. Um, and this is where the real opportunity is. So almost all of these impacts uh, are driven. If you look at agriculture's overall contribution, about 70% of it is animal agriculture. 30% is all the rest of agriculture, but it's profoundly driven by animal agriculture. And the general argument is, well, it has to be this way. That's what people want, and there's nothing that can be done about that, and we need industrial agriculture, because otherwise we're all sort of working our way back into the Stone Ages. Uh, but the reality is, uh, it doesn't have to be this way. There are lots of other ways to produce food, uh, whether plants or animals that are much more sustainable, highly productive, and much more climate friendly. And of course, the most the biggest opportunity is to switch from growing animals uh, to going to a more plant-based. It's, it's again, it's sort of like moving to inherently cleaner productivity, not needing all that grazing land, and instead of 15 pounds of grain making one pound of beef, you get the 15 pounds of grain. Um, these are just some of the better practices. It's a whole range of them. We're focusing on animal agriculture, so different grazing approaches. But I think it's sometimes people say, well, you know, you need to graze on land that can't put crops, so we need to use that land for something. But actually, that land is often good for maybe different types of crops, maybe not a row crop, but tree crops, uh, which in certainly in indigenous times were a big part of the food crops uh, of the populations here. Uh, and also, of course, carbon sequestration, in a sense, is a crop, uh, because we need carbon sequestration more than we need a lot of extra food right now. Um, and so how do we get there? As I said earlier, our system is not a happenstance. Our system is there because it has been created to support and encourage uh, commodity crops and animal agriculture. And so to change that, we have to change those incentives. We have to change the farm bill, uh, which is up for authorization now. I can talk to you about it in the Q&A if people are interested. We have to change our pollution laws. Here we have, for example, a CAFO, these confined animal feeding operations that were mentioned, are the largest source of toxic emissions, ammonia, and hydrogen sulfide. Every other source of, the, of these toxic pollutants has to report and limit their pollution. Agriculture? No. Agriculture is exempt from those water air pollution limits. CAFOs are also one of the largest sources of nutrient pollution and pathogen pollution. All other sources have to have limits on those. CAFOs? Largely exempt. All that 800 million acres of grazing land, 200, 400 million acres of cropland, largely exempt from water pollution standards. When we change that, we'll start creating different incentives for what we're growing. Uh, and then it comes what we're talking about today, uh, why we have to look at this overall. The same way we've transformed our energy system, not just by trying to clean up coal plants, but we have energy efficiency. We have in, uh, LED light bulbs, more efficient refrigerators, more efficient cars. Uh, and we've also gone to clean energy, solar and wind. In the same way with agriculture, we can't just try to think about how do we have cow grazing not be quite as bad. We have to think about efficiency, less food waste, and not having a food system which is as inefficient as 15 to 1 as a cow is. And if you look at this, you can see that the greenhouse gas footprint per pound of beef vastly exceeds that of anything else. And I'll, I'll just leave you with this one last chart, which is uh, something called the global calculator .net. you can go to it and play around with it but this is sort of a project prediction of where we're going to be and the, the dark light is sort of the standard projection but what's amazing about this is if the rest of the world comes up with a high meat diet like the US has 
even with the strongest uh, uh, reductions in energy and transportation and building and in everything else, we're fried uh, as a planet. On the other hand, if they do nothing, and we, the Western, the Northern and Western world, switch to a lower meat diet, we almost reach our climate targets as a result of that. It's a huge lever that is rarely even talked about in policy circles. So part of what we're doing is trying to get that lever to address climate change back into the discourse. So thank you and look forward to questions. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Professor. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now we're gonna go kind of into a Q&A discussion section. This is very loose. Um, if you have any comments or questions, just raise your hand. Uh, if it's directed to someone in particular, you can say so. If it's directed to everybody, that's also fine. Yeah. Um, for everyone, uh, I'm wondering if you can use a lot of safety that is created using biological intelligence and artificial intelligence. I'll just repeat the question so you can hear it in case you didn't profess it. Uh, what, the question is, what's your opinion on fake meat and how, it's, how it can be created using uh, artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence and mycelium. And mycelium. I'm sorry, are you referring to the clean meat endeavors here, or are you referring to the... Yeah, clean. So there, so there's it's not clean. Yeah, there's clean meat and there's attractive if you're an engineer or if you just like some sort of solar punk vision of veganism. I'm not that guy. Um, I think I'm in favor of any anything that, that reduces animal suffering. So if we really see a substitution of the chicken breast with the lab grown chicken breast, and you know if you're thinking about buying one of those things, go for it. But of course um, it doesn't solve these big three, big four, big five types of problems. We still have that it's Unhealthy. We still have that it. it's debatably not even food. Um, so personally, I, I can't really say that I would be eager to include it into my own diet. But if we really do believe, or if someone does believe that it would change our infrastructures, then I'm not interested in in finding uh, amongst people like us at all. Um, do you want to go? Yeah. Yes, right here. Um, this is a question for Isaac, and this is not a criticism at all, but um, you said that you haven't found evidence for um, eating, uh, sorry, uh, eating, consuming dairy products. But have you found like evidence of the benefits of eating a vegan diet? Um, there's some. There's some. Uh, some is the wrong word. Uh, it's, it's insane how insurmountable the evidence is in favor of the whole food plant-based diet. Um, and I'm happy to get into what those things are. I'm not a nutritionist, so Pam should really be doing it. Um, it's insurmountable. I mean, again, I looked for any reason to drink dairy, including the our typical what we teach in kindergarten, it makes healthy bones. And sure enough, modern science says the exact opposite. So we can get into the details, but for now, I guess I'll give you guys all a, a minor promise that I just haven't found any. Um, thank you for all your input. Um, just for a bit of background, I come from upstate New York. I've lived on a farm my whole life. I've worked on farms my entire life. And particularly small scale agricultural operations that have animals that they like, love and care about dearly. It's not at all what you were describing, in which they could not care less about the conditions of the animals. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Um, in addition to not feeding them grain and, and not doing a lot of these traditional like cave feeding practices, um, and a lot of these farms have found ways to integrate that with sustainable um, plant production, not using fertilizers and things like that, at least in my experience at home. Um, and I guess like I'm curious about your input as that sort of operation is a viable 
option in our future because it's like in my experience it's quite the opposite of what you've been describing in terms of industrial agriculture in the midwest for example so i i will um say that if all farms move towards the farm that you're describing we would greatly, greatly reduce the amount of meat that is in the U.S. diet because the only way to produce the vast amount of meat that we have is by the combined animal feeding operation that grow, you know, what was on that the map that was up here. If we moved in that direction and it was about caring for and about the animals being treated well, many fewer of them used to produce um, plant-based foods, and there's other ways to do that too, but but that would actually, probably in that last graphic, it would probably actually start like trend towards that line of what would happen because there would be, you know, it, it just would very, very much decrease the amount of animals that people are eating just because of the proportions of animals to plants on farms like that that I've been on. Um, so. I think that that would be another way to go. The farm bill makes moving in that direction not impossible because everything can be, can be changed by policy, but the what is set up, it makes it that moving in that direction ticks along extremely slowly. And if we you know, could have more about, you know, this is what I think, if we could move it more in that direction, we would be doing better on our land conservation. We would be doing better on everyone's diet. And by the way, to build on what was said before is all what are called epidemiological studies, which just are like, what are people eating and how healthy are there? More plant-based is better. And it's, you know, it's a continuum of better. So it is more plant-based is better um, than more animal-based in any way that research on nutrition is done. Yeah, and just for those, I guess like the buzzword that you're, you're suggesting is this regenerative approach that people are discussing today. But I can say, right, right, right. So you've been doing this for a long time, and and you do see that this is like a sort of movement. There's some discourse here now, exactly along these lines of what you're describing. I'll just add again that vegan is this magic bullet that solves a lot of problems. Um, and even if I could imagine, which I can't. Uh, a world that completely shifts to this style of farming, I still don't think that is the same type of magic bullet. Um, yeah. yes. um, what are your thoughts on like the connection between the food industry and the uh, healthcare pharmaceutical industry? And do you think there's going to be? A, do you think there's any pushback um, in shifting towards a plant-based food supply by those other industries? Happy to take that, but <laughs> I feel like yeah, you two yeah. should really take that. Uh, yeah. Did you hear the question, Professor? The connection's kind of unstable. Yeah, and also I think we should probably all chime in on these questions. I feel like we yeah. probably all have answers. Um, so the, the question is like, is there a relation between pharmaceuticals and animal agriculture? Does the pharmaceutical industry create a sort of friction for us as a movement? Like, do they lobby for things? Do they lobby for things? Oh, gee, I don't know. They might, might they? Um, yeah. The answer to these questions is yes. I would. Uh, I guess in my introduction, I mentioned that there is this big lobby group of lobbyists, just like there's a military-industrial complex, there's an agricultural-industrial complex. Um, so this is tricky, and again, we have to open our critical faculties here. Um, just so all of you know, I, I think something that vegans should like really need to be aware about is the presence of Monsanto Bayer to start with. Um, as you can tell, all three of us are a bit concerned with monocropping, um, and we're concerned with corn and soy. Uh, Monsanto Bayer doesn't own 51% of the world's corn and soy. Uh, Perhaps you guys have the exact statistics. It's definitely in the 90s. This is a monopoly. Um, 
And I guess I'd like to ask you all a question. Uh, for those of you who've eaten chicken nuggets and plant-based chicken nuggets, what do you like more? Um, so who thinks the plant-based chicken nuggets just don't taste quite as good as a regular chicken nugget? You can be real. Like I, I don't think a, a vegan buffalo wing has ever competed with the buffalo wing. I'm embarrassed about it, but I, I do think that's true. Um, so you think the regular chicken nugget is a little bit better or something? Okay, who is like, no way, we are winning. Actually, the vegan chicken nugget <laughs> Is the new tech, it's even better. Does anyone who think that? I've had non-vegans tell me this. Um, so I disagree with all of you, they're just the same. I mean, it's a processed slime. We cover it in <laughs> breading, we fry it, we put it in a freezer bag, and then we deliver it to our children. Um, for me, these are exactly the same product when they enter you know, my digestive tract. Um, so what's easier to produce if you're Tyson? Um, I, I would like to say, I think Pete's made a very strong case that the plant-based chicken nugget is really easy to produce rather than chicken nuggets. So here, I'd like to ask you a question. Why would Tyson even want to produce the chicken nugget anymore? Um, and to parallel that, I'd like you all, if you want, go ahead and Google this. Like if you've ever had a Jack in the Box taco, which I have had a lot of, um, they're not mostly meat, they're mostly TVP. Uh, plant-based meat substitute. So Jack in the Box is kind of agreeing with me. Uh, it's expensive to grow beef. So I'd like to really seriously think about why do we think Tyson would not want to make this transition to the plant-based nugget, the same crappy slime, and just make it way cheaper. And what you find, or at least what I find, is that this is a major problem with capitalism and its desire to burn resources at all. And the pharmaceutical industry is the clearest example of this. The pharmaceutical industry has no interest in anybody approaching preemptive medicine. There's no profit. Similarly, Monsanto Bayer has no interest in moving towards some sort of system where we grow much, much less corn and soy. So yes, there's a complex. If there was a, a bourgeois enemy, uh, yes, the pharmaceutical industry is an easy target. Can I just throw something in on that? Uh, there's a great book by Marilyn McKenna on called, I think it's called Big Chicken, uh, which points out that the pharmaceutical industry was really struggling. They had these great new antibiotics, but the trouble is antibiotics they only use occasionally uh, when people are sick. Uh, and so how do you make money on them? And it turns out that they found that uh, feeding antibiotics to animals makes them grow fatter faster. Uh, and also compensates, keeps them a little healthier when they're living basically wallowing in their own poop. Uh, and so right now, about 70% of medically important antibiotics are not used on sick people, they're used on healthy animals uh, in these animal factories, which uh, many people, including the World Health Organization, the CDC, and others view as one of the greatest threats we face of a sort of a global pandemic of an antibiotic resistant disease. And already I think something like 35,000 people a year die in the US every year because of antibiotic resistant disease. And uh, I think over 2 million get sick. And we, you know, we just came out of the COVID pandemic and relatively speaking, that was mild. Uh, and yet we are risking antibiotics probably because of which at least half of us, you in the room are there. Without that, something would have gotten you. Uh, and uh, just because we want cheap meat. Uh, and that is, uh, for me, the most extreme example of uh, the, the industrial system of meat production gone totally awry. And to add on to that, which we'll, I'll get back to your question in a second, but is, um, you just said Monsanto Bear is 90% of the corn, corn and soy, which 90% of the corn and soy in this country is GMO corn and soy. And we're not gonna talk about GMO, or we could talk about GMOs, but, but basically they're all done for one thing. Um, they are done to make them resistant to pesticides. And everyone said when they started to do this, which was in the early 90s, you're gonna make, just like antibiotics start not working, you're gonna make the pesticides not work. Don't make this change. And they said, oh no, it won't happen. And so now a lot of the corn and soy are stacked to have 
up to five different pesticides that they can handle, and there's still what are called super weeds growing. Oh, and corn is a tall, you know, this is field corn, is a tall plant, and the, the weeds are growing. If you drove, drive through the wind, 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 not Midwest now, and you see it, you're gonna see there's a lot of weeds growing over it. It's not because they're not applying pesticides, they're applying more than ever. Um, and all of that corn and soy is going to feeding animals, to make process, ultra-processed food products, and to make biofuels, and there's much, much, much research that biofuels, all the inputs that produce them, even though they're coming from plants, are actually making it that we're, it's, this, it's equal in energy. It's just working our economic system. It is not good for the environment at all. And so we're stacking that on. So we're doing the same thing that we're doing with antibiotics in the animals to the pesticides on the plants that we're taking, you know, what could be used theoretically for good, right? Like in a way to get rid of pests and, and, and blowing it up. But then, you know, Monsanto Bayer, so Bayer is obviously known for the aspirin company, bought Monsanto, which is known for one of the most widely used. Has probably six times the carbon footprint. The studies show three to six times. The carbon footprint of a pound of American beef because of more recent deforestation, loss of tropical habitat, less, they're less in a feedlot, they live longer before they get to uh, slaughter weight, so they're belching gas, methane a lot more. So if we were to shut down beef production in this country without dealing with demand, we just import and hunt for beef from Paraguay and Brazil and other countries, which would not be a net benefit to the climate. Uh, so supply side and demand side issues really have to go hand in hand when you've got this very, very porous international market for food. Maybe one more question. I was just wondering regarding like the chicken nugget example. So um, I guess like in your view, the phenomenon, like what is like, is, is it more like a consequence of just like the perils of capitalism itself or is it sort of more of like uh, actual like interventionist policies like uh, you know surplus like buying up of surpluses and like artificially like increasing the prices which cause like production to increase uh, to actually like make it worse and produce uh, you know far more waste. So I, I think this is exactly the question I want you all to ask. I mean, how, what do we do about this sort of fact that, that he's suggesting, which is that the system likes burning things? It does. Um, so I'll be the young radical here, I guess, and just say, yeah, it's, it's capitalism. And I don't mean capitalism as in whatever the heck is going on in the US, but as an abstract, we trade commodities and resources for, for money and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and it requires growth, and it incentivizes resource destruction, like we're talking about, uh, resource destruction of animal bodies, resource destruction of the human body so that we can take medicine and, and, and basically be farmed ourselves. Um, yeah, this bothers me a lot. I, I don't have anything sort of reformist to say here. All I can say is that radically we should be critical of capitalism. I don't have a better answer. Are those policies themselves though, like themselves not anti-capitalistic though? Like, if they're going to, like for example, like providing for subsidies for the cattle industry uh, and whatnot, like, is that uh, not- no, I mean, like... it's the most neoliberal thing ever. I mean, it's, it's saying we like our food to be privatized. In fact, we need to do everything in our power to make sure our food is privatized. And, you know, we talk about importing and exporting things. I mean, we do it a lot. Uh, we do it a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, yeah, I don't know if that perfectly answered your question. Uh, but I, I would actually like to ask both of you if I, I, I thought we might get here, and uh, I do wonder if you two have a maybe a more optimistic answer to this. What do we do about this fact that they want to burn the land? Uh, what kind of policies can we do to assist with this? <laughs> um, I mean, I think. You know, the farm farm bill is coming up, and what ends up happening is most of it stays, you know, like it's every five to six years. It's a 
slow turning ship, so a lot of it stays the same, but we have to be advocating for the policies that will go for conservation, that will support farmers that are growing corn and soy to try even five acres doing something else and that there's supports to do that. There are ways that we can advocate for it. Will this next farm bill that will probably pass sometime this year transform it to have a food system that's everything like your, the farm that you were describing? It's not going to happen because it, 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 it's a slow moving shift, but if we don't believe that that can work, then we've given up hope. And the, the side of all the companies that are pushing for everything to just keep going towards using more and more resources, having more and more throughput, will advocate for the policies and those will get passed. So, you know, there's a lot that we, you know, have to wonder how, what humanity is going to be like in the next couple of decades. Um, but if we don't believe that we can still fight for making change, then we it won't happen because it's going to take all of us really advocating for you know those little changes. And sometimes with policy, what I've learned is you may not get everything that you want at this time, but you're chipping away at getting the right things. And that's hard, particularly when we see that the problems are so big and particularly when you want to see NASA change. But the reality is, is I thought that the first time that I started advocating for the farm bill. It was like, well, we're just going to make this next farm bill change everything and we're going to be in a great place. And then I talked to people that have been doing it for 20, 30, 40 years and they were like, Pam, hey, that's not the way it works. And it's, you know, it, but, but can we make it better? Yes. And if we don't try, basically the people that are, are wanting the system to be more of what it is now in the destructive way will be doing that. I don't know if that can works. I just put some specifics on that? When we were lobbying on the Farm Bill in 2018, even our allies said, don't mention climate change, because if you mention climate change, you're going to have to pay extra for it, uh, in the sense of uh, the sort of, whoa. Uh, can you hear? Breaking up a little. Go ahead. I think you're good. OK, I'll say. So in 2018, we couldn't even talk about climate change. Um, and now we're lobbying that it was supposed to be the 2023 Farm Bill, but of course, Congress couldn't do it, so they punted, and it's until September 2024. I mean, I think most people I talk to on the Hill and our team think the chances are less than 50-50 we'll get a farm bill this year, but we'll see. Uh, but everybody is talking about climate change. Uh, now, we may disagree, but even the Farm Bureau, the most powerful farm lobby, in 2018, their official platform was that climate change basically didn't exist as a you know human-caused climate change. Now, even the Farm Bureau acknowledges that climate change is real. And in the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act, which yes, was passed only with Democratic votes, it was the first time that Congress acknowledged the link between climate change and agriculture. They put $20 billion into the IRA specifically for conservation programs, farm bill conservation programs, but only for practices that reduce, sequester, or eliminate uh, greenhouse, net greenhouse gases. Now, we're fighting with USDA over some of those practices, which ones count as, as redu reducing greenhouse gases, and animal ones are hot and are in the center of that. But nonetheless, uh, as Pam was saying, you do get progress. In 2018, climate change was nowhere on the horizon, and we couldn't talk about it. Now it is actually in the IRA, and we are fighting to make sure, and of course, the Republicans are trying to move that uh, IRA funding into commodity programs just straight out subsidies to peanut uh, cotton and, and, so, and rice farmers. Uh, but we are, I think the Democrats will stay strong, will stay firm. Senator Sabinow, who is the chair of the Senate Ag Committee, has made clear that she's not going to lose that climate, those climate provisions uh, in the next farm bill. So we have made some progress. There's a lot of ways we can go into it. Uh, if people are care about this, I've written lots of blogs on this, on the Farm Bill, and there's a podcast with Dave Roberts I did, why the Farm Bill is the biggest environmental law Congress will pass in the next couple of years. 
uh, and which is not a, well known. And one of the challenges we have is the environmental community, which is a relatively strong lobby on Capitol Hill, largely ignores the farm bill. And part of what we, a few of us have been doing over the last few years is to try to get the environmental community as a whole, not just a few renegades within it, to pay attention to the farm bill. Because otherwise, as Pam said, it, you know, the industrial ag lobby is going to control the debate. So what's great is we've now gotten finally, for the first time ever, the CEOs of all the major environmental groups going to the Hill and saying, we need a climate-friendly farm bill. Uh, you need to protect the climate guardrails in the Inflation Reduction Act. And that's made it, that's making a bit of a difference. Not nearly as much as one as we need, but it's definitely moving towards progress. Um, I just wanted to ask one like, final quick question. So I think um, there is like, like an increasing amount of science that says like plant-based food systems are more sustainable, and like there's like growing awareness of veganism in general. But um, like like as moving on from that, like what are some actionable ways we can actually support farmers? Uh, because they're like often forgotten. Like there's a growing sentiment in the vegan community to, to support farmers. So like what are some things that we can do for like through advocacy, for example, or like through our campaign career in the future as well? Vote and get every and get everybody you know to vote. Uh, I seriously, I, I hate to say this, but demographically, those under thirty are the lowest voting demographic in the country, uh, and you guys are going to face climate change a lot longer than I am. So, basically, the most important thing you can do is vote. Uh, I also, I, I would like to highlight again that, I, I, I mean, at least like to talk to all of you about what it's like to be a vegan and how you can do it. And there's different kinds of vegans, right? There's the vegans who eat the Tyson chicken nugget, and <laughs> there's the vegan who goes to the farmer's market. And that's a really easy answer to your question. As a rule of thumb, I, I, I just think it's kind of obvious that to me, a human beings should eat plants that are grown closest to their own feet. Um, and you can do that here. I don't, honestly, I say this with kind of embarrassment, I don't know any of the food options here uptown. I went to NYU, I lived in Brooklyn. I don't know what's going on up here. But living in Brooklyn, I have farmer's market access most days of the week. And that's something a lot of New Yorkers take for granted. If I do walk up and down my block, and I go into all the bodegas and look at the produce, it can be a little sad. Um, Going to the farmer's market is this like beautifully liberating thing. I know the person who grows my potatoes. I go and I talk with them every week. And veganism is a discipline. I do think that there's something important to be said about following this discipline in order to be able to advise you know, anyone else. So I'll say let's start with the cell and let's try going to some farmer's markets. It's a really easy thing to do. Sure. <laughs> I was like recently speaking with a Colombian professor about like this like activist activism towards like more like plant based diet, and their point was essentially like two points like from a development perspective like if we look at, look at this like at a global level from a development perspective like there is still a lot of issue of food security and like affordability and like availability of like nutritious food for a lot of like a big part of like the population, so is it like fair? to like kind of like do activism like towards like these kind of diet in like those kind of countries. And then from like more of like a climate justice kind of perspective, if you look at like meat consumption, there are a lot of like more than let's say developing countries, for example like China, that are increasing a lot of meat consumption. So is it fair to kind of like force them to stay in a more plant-based kind of diet while we were the like the kind of like cause for like the, the global emissions? Um, looking at it from just a food security and what if we could just say what do we produce that would actually help everyone to be able to eat well the amount of animal food in the United States and other countries similar to the United States would go way 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 down in some other countries actually trying to get everyone well nourished and doing that in a way that is going to work for what can be produced where they are, animal consumption would go up a little bit. 
overall on a global scale, animal consumption would go way, way down if that was the parameter. Because food is a market-based economy, it is very hard to say, you know, tell everyone what they are, are supposed to do. And are we going to get everyone in the United States to become a vegan? I, no, like a dietary change is really, really hard. Would we benefit our health and the planet if everyone went more towards plant-based foods, was eating foods more closer to home, and everyone, you know, from where, where, not everyone, but most people took a few big steps in that direction, would we be helping the planet and would we be helping our health? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I think it's like, where do we, where do we want, to, how do we want to look at it from like a higher level or a lower level? It sounds like whatever the professor you were talking to is, is really looking at it at a larger system level and, and thinking about it globally. And I think when you think about it on that level and you're thinking about big population genes, that's where, you know, like it's like, how would we shift everyone given what they can have and given the economic, you know, like everything that's going on, that's what it usually comes um, and I guess it, to me it kind of sounds like the question is, and I, I don't take offense to this, uh, I'm a white dude, how can I go tell someone in East New York, hey, come over to the farmer's market in, in Williamsburg or something, right? I sympathize with this. Uh, I, I agree that it's hard to be a pragmatic activist and it's easy to be condescending and pretentious. It is. <laughs> and again, this is why being vegan is hard. Uh, it's easy in all the ways of the way that diet is supposed to actually affect you, but it's so hard socially. Um, and it's hard because, objectively, do I think that the people of East New York should eat whole food plant-based? Yes. Why? Because I think that's what human beings should eat. Um, do I think it's easy to go out of my way to tell them what they are supposed to do? Absolutely not. I, I'm not comfortable doing that at all. Uh, now what's optimal? I hope we all find out. I, if I can, on, on that one just last point, and I keep drawing in part because I've worked in environmental law and it's suing power companies and dealing with the energy transformation for 30 years, uh, is we don't talk about uh, everyone, we're going to have to get rid of cars. We talk about let's have more efficient cars and, and the fuel economy standard instance way up from 14 to 18 to 21 to 23 and set miles a gallon. Bit by bit, over decades, the cars have gotten more efficient. And now we're switching into electric vehicles. Uh, and for a long time, we were trying to clean up power plants, and then sort of uh, this price of solar energy slowly went down as there were subsidies, there were requirements to install solar power. And then finally, in 2013, it was sort of switched that more renewable energy was built than fossil energy. But we still have a long way to go to transform our whole energy system. It's, I think, in some ways, because any individual can make a shift. I'm gonna go all vegan or I'm gonna go not at all, I'm gonna eat you know, my hamburger every day. Um, we tend to have a conversation as if society is gonna be similarly sort of bipolar like that. But in every other sector, change takes a long, long time. And the food system has millions of people working on it, has lots of cultural accretions and political power. And so I think it will be better off if we think of it as just another sector of the economy. And again, I look at this from a political perspective, and I think one can look at it from a moral perspective or religious or other perspectives, but from a purely per political perspective as a legal advocate, how do we get there, is stop sort of confusing what an individual can do, although individuals can and should take action themselves. But as society, we have to look at it as this long-term transformation change. So you can change your light bulb, but we also have to have lots of work to have cleaner, more efficient energy and change light bulbs. The first you know, efficient light bulbs are terrible. They flickered all the time. Now LEDs are great. Uh, so we think we need to think about, I think, food system transformation in that same larger way. And then the demand side, becomes one piece of a larger transforming change. Okay, so I have a few 
my concluding remarks, but before that, can we thank the speakers for tonight? Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I learned a lot. Everyone else did. Uh, like everybody else, you know, I also didn't grow up eating a plant-based diet. I wasn't born as a, as a vegan. But once I learned, once I learned that it was possible to be happy and healthy and to thrive on a plant-based diet, um, I realized that my impact on climate change, food justice, and animal abuse was a choice that was available to me. And it was primarily a matter of what was on my plate three times a day. Of course, there are other things too. I hope this event has shown you guys how intersectional the issue of animal agriculture, animal consumption uh, is. It touches on climate change, public health, personal health, animal rights, obviously, a bunch of other things. And communicating this is basically one of the goals of ASAP, communi communicating it to the Columbia uh, community. I encourage everybody here, obviously, uh, to consider going vegan for all the reasons mentioned in the talks, as well as for animals. The animals are the forgotten victims of what we're talking about, right? We all know that animals can feel. We know that they can suffer. We don't think of farm animals as individuals because we never spend time with them, and when we see them in videos of factory farms, they don't look like individuals, right? But they are. If you have a dog or a cat, or if you have any other companion animal, or if you spend time with any animal, really, they have personalities. Every single one is an individual, no different from your dog or cat, right? Why do you stick a fork into one and pet the other is the basic question. There is nothing humane, you know, people talk about, oh, we can do things humanely, uh, you know, small farms, local this, local that. There is nothing humane about a knockbox. There is nothing humane about gas chambers, which is if you eat pigs, that's where that's how they're killed. There is nothing humane about a kill line. There's nothing humane about electric shocks, about scalding tanks of water, right? There is nothing humane about slaughter. There is no humane slaughter any more than there is humane rape, humane torture, humane mutilation. It's an oxymoron. So if anybody's interested in getting involved with this sort of thing, what I think, if you just look at the numbers, is the greatest moral atrocity in history and only getting bigger. <laughs> Please, talk to me, talk to Leo, Get involved, do something, right? A vegan world is better for everybody, every sentient being, not just humans.